Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's, it's great to hear you all out there. And we've got about 100 people with us online, so good morning to you online. Thank you for being here. I'm Philomena Mantello, the president at Grand Valley State University, the proud president of Grand Valley State University, of the Grand Valley State University. So thank you, thank you for coming today. I'm really, really excited about today's guest speaker, and I am not doing the introduction, so I will reserve um, Quentin's introduction um, for our provost, who is co-hosting this fireside chat with me. The Fireside Chat series, and this is our seventh, Lucky Seven, is really about um, thinking always steps beyond our university doors around the future of education, and there's nothing more important than the context we live in. And it is such an exciting time in Michigan and the economic development space, so I'm really excited. I heard Quentin speak at the Right Place Board, and it took me about two minutes to say, you need to come and do a fireside chat with us, um, because I loved his optimism, uh, attitude, and um, just vision for us as a region and a state. And um, you're not shy about it, which I also really enjoy. Um, <laughs> So I will just welcome you all to the series and look forward to the conversation. I'll turn it over to Chris Pluff, our wonderful interim provost. Thank you, President Mantella. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce our, our, uh, our featured guest this morning, uh, as well as our moderator of the session. And so I'm going to start off with our featured guest. Uh, as President Mantella said, we have uh, Quentin Messer with us, Jr. Sorry, Quentin Messer, Jr. Um, this morning, who is the Chief Executive Officer, President and Chair of the Michigan Strategic Fund. Uh, as the Michigan Economic Development Corporation CEO and President and Chair of the Michigan Strategic Fund, Quentin is charged with implementing and executing MEDC's core mission in business development and attraction, community development, providing access to capital enhancing Michigan's image and brand with a focus on building a strong and equitable economy for all Michiganders. His responsibilities include managing the administration of all programs, funds, personnel, contracts, and other administrative functions of MEDC. Professionally, Quentin is a member of the Governor Whitmer's cabinet and serves on the boards of the American Center for Mobility, Michigan Israel Business Accelerator, International Economic Development Council, and Oklahoma University's Economic Development Institute and is a member of the Michigan Council on Climate Solutions. He's named by Financial Times as a member of the 2021 Agenda Diversity 100, Crane's Detroit Business, 50 Names to Know in Government in 2021, Biz New New Orleans CEO of the Year in 2020, Biz New Orleans Business Person of the Year in 2019 uh, by Consultants Connect and as one of North America's top 50 economic developers in 2020 and 2019 by Ebony Magazine for its Ebony Power 100 as a Power Player 2018. Immediately prior to joining MEDC, Quentin was president and CEO at the New Orleans Business Alliance, which under his leadership became one of fewer than 80 accredited economic development organizations worldwide. He also previously served as the assistant secretary for Louisiana Economic Development, which is Louisiana's Department of Economic Development. He's an alumnus of the Boston Consulting Group and O'Melveny and Myers LLP, and it has degrees from Princeton and Columbia Universities. So welcome, Quentin. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Clinton, we have a fire behind us. Did you notice oh, we have wow. a fire? This <laughs> well, is a real fireside chat. Let me tell you something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to say you should give it up for your president and your provost. What tremendous, give it up for them. What tremendous <laughs> leaders. Um, so much of what happens. And, I, I think it'll be more interesting to have the questions mm -hmm. than me sort of talk, but I, I do want to sort of talk about three points. Um, but so much of the change that's required is because of the people who lead. We're all leaders, but there are certain people who have to wake up and deal with the consequences. I tell people all the time, you know, being a university president is like being a governor or a mayor. You have thousands of people for whom you have to be concerned about, their safety, their intellectual well-being. So it is wonderful that you've got a dynamic leadership, visionary leadership. Um, 
Three things, and then we will open up for questions. If that's okay with you, Madam President. Absolutely. We are living in a state that has unprecedented potential and opportunity. And I say that ob objectively. I've lived, I'm a native Floridian. Um, I went to undergrad in New Jersey. I went to grad school in New York. I've lived in Illinois, Pennsylvania, the state to the south. And I moved up, did anybody catch that, by the way? And I moved, <laughs> and I moved up from Louisiana. Michigan has the number one thing that companies, universities, people look for. It has great human capital. You're a big part of that. Um, what we in Michigan have to do is change the way we talk about ourselves. You know, I, I, I don't apologize, I'm a Christian. I'm not, I'm not, don't try to impose that, but a lot of what I think is influenced by that journey and we are speaking spirits. And what you put out in the world is what you're gonna walk into. And I think there's a lot of wistfulness sometimes as if Michigan's best days are behind. That's not true. And one of the things I, so, so we have to change that. Grand Valley has a tremendous future that you're seizing. And, and you can shape that by how you speak about it. Michigan can shape it by how we speak about it. So that's one. Two, we're in a moment where Michigan is going to be over the next five to 10 years, maybe even 20 years, a climate winner. With the rise of extreme weather, it is gonna make certain parts of the world and certain parts of North America increasingly difficult to inhabit. Michigan is gonna be a winner. We have to set up the business environment to be welcoming of people of all from all across the world. Michigan is Michigan in part because whether, like in my family, I have family members from rural Georgia, southwest Georgia, who came up in a great migration. There are people who came from western, central, and eastern Europe. People came from the near and far east. They all found a place here in Michigan because of economic possibility. And I would say our population growth is going to be part and parcel, our ability to get back to that people feeling like they're welcome. I think West Michigan has a unique opportunity because there's great momentum here, but there's a perception. I think West Michigan is far more welcoming than people perceive it. You can be a part of working with your business community here and, and changing that narrative. And the final point before we open up for questions and really have a dialogue is that we are in an era in which it's going to be an imperative to have and create a state of lifelong learners. That's why the work you do here is so critically important. It's not just going to be people think of college and from years 18 through 24. They're going to think about it at 44 or I'm almost 54. Some people may think about it at 64 or 74. We have to create those opportunities for people, whether it's associate degrees, bachelors, masters, PhDs, uh, doctors of education, you name it. But we also have to think about ways to provide credentialing and other opportunities. Because as the nature of work changes, the necessity for people to be kind of retooled is gonna continue and that's why it's an imperative that higher education and economic development come together. It is not an or. Sometimes people like to pit things against each other. It's an and. You are a part of creating the greatest asset that this state has. It's human beings, it's the mind. It's problem solving. It's the life of the mind that you cultivate every day. And so that's why it's important things to do. And the la absolute last thing is, I am a homer for higher education. I'm married to higher education. My wife has been a higher education professional for 30 years. She's um, 
currently uh, president and CEO of the Louisiana Association of Independent Colleges University. She's going to give up that opportunity to move up here. And, and she would have been a university president had she married a different person. So I am great, very grateful for her, her sacrifices. But I understand whether she was in enrollment management or she did fundraising or now she leads the independent colleges and lobbying and she was in student activities. The life of the mind, the university, is a vital part of the growth of any community. So you should feel incredibly good about what you do. Um, and I just, I got some statistics. Um, so let me, let me before, uh, absolutely, the absolute last thing, is Midar Sarata? Madar. Madar yes. Sarata? Give it up for, for him. He was one of the nominees to be one of the top professors in the state. Give it up for him. Absolutely. Your colleague. Look at that type of excellence that you have here. Um, I'm a huge sports fanatic. Um, so I didn't realize this until I looked at the statistics. But Grand Valley State has the second most team championships of any university in the state of Michigan. And in Division II overall, you have the eight most, 27 team, and you have the 14th most individual, 79. I say that because winning is an attitude and is about a narrative. And this is a university that wins. And you have to talk about that. And so uh, I'm very grateful to be here. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much for your introductory comments. M much appreciated. I'm going to now introduce uh, Dr. Paul Isley, who is uh, going to be moderating our session and our Q&A here uh, this morning. Uh, Dr. Isley is currently the Associate Dean and uh, Professor of Economics for the Seidman College of Business at Grand Valley State University. And he joined Grand Valley faculty back in 1995 after earning his PhD in economics from Purdue University. Uh, Dr. Isley, is, Dr. Isley uh, has taught more than 100 classes and 4,000 students uh, in his time frame. Uh, he's very active in public service, as many of you know. His research led to his first appointment by Governor Snyder and then renewed by Governor Whitmer. Uh, of Michigan to the to the Utility Consumer Participation Board where he currently serves as their chair. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Paul Isley. Thanks, Excellent. Paul. Thank you. So I think I'll start with some questions that have happened online here. So, uh, and I think we'll give you one to sort of, uh, sort of showcase where the MEDC is going. Uh, you, you've been looking and dealing with a reorganization. How does that reflect your goals and strategy for the MEDC in 2022 and beyond? So great, great question. So um, I think it's critically important, and I know the president and the provost feel the same way, and all of you, is that you have to be accessible when you are blessed to be in these leadership opportunities. So I, I've had the occasion to travel across this great state, and it was clear to me that there are two things that we needed to do really urgently at MEDC. We needed to be more responsive and understand who our customer was and be committed and responsive to customer service. And then we needed to be regionally relevant. There are 83 counties in this great state, two peninsulas, one shared destiny. And it was impossible for us in Lansing to be able to articulate what needs to be happen here in Grand Rapids or Holland or Muskegon or Escanaba, or Marquette, or Iron Mountain, or Detroit, or uh, Tiawasa City, or Alpena, wherever. And so we needed to restructure ourselves so that it was clear that we were going to be regionally relevant. Regionally relevant, customer focused, and then we are going to have to make sure that we had deep industry knowledge in certain ver verticals. So, Obviously, you know, we all know and have been reading about the changes in the mobility sector. You know, we know that the propulsion mechanism is changing from internal combustion to electric and maybe even hydrogen. But there are other industries that are critically important. Here in Grand Rapids, life sciences, and critically important digital health, opportunities for path-breaking new uh, precision medicine, 
in cancer treatment with Banff and others. Um, then there was also semiconductors. I mean, we, you know, I, I had heard of Intel. You know, I've seen the Intel inside on my laptop for years, but I hadn't thought about chips as much as I've thought about chips in the last <laughs> nine months. You know, I think everybody's talking about chips. And, you know, you got these, you know, cars that, you know, um, don't have all the features because of chips. So we at MEDC had to be responsive to that. And the final thing is we created, I believe that if you say things are important, you need to have senior executives who wake up thinking about those things that you've said are important. We said talent was important, so we created a chief talent solutions and engagement officer. We said that it was going to be important for us to be better about real estate, so we created a chief real estate um, and engagement officer, real estate development and engagement officer. And if we said customer service is going to be important, um, our number two in the organization, Jen Nelson, in her title, she's not only the chief operating officer, she's also the chief customer experience officer. Because we want people to understand how important, it wasn't just a talk. No, we really mean it. We're going to be serious about that. And, and so we announced it last month. It will go in effect May 1. We're going to wrap it prototype. There may be certain things that we think that we should do, but we'll get feedback from the market, feedback from our colleagues, and we'll change again. We have to get organizations comfortable with the notion of adaptability and flexibility. That's critically important. Spectacular. Um, Grand Valley uh, not only generates some of the talent that you're talking about, uh, but also has many outreach centers like the SBDC, like the Nando Global Trade. How can we support as you go through those changes? Well, look, you know, I, um, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned SBDC, you know, JD Collins' team, shout out to them doing a remarkable job, you know, particularly during the, the COVID, but even before. It is important for, we talked about, I talked about regional relevance. This university was created as a, almost as a function of a partnership with the local business community and higher ed. Mm -hmm. And that unique partnership always has a certain level of market relevancy. That's going to be incredibly important. And I think what you do in global trade, what you do in small business, Every business starts as a small business. You know, whether you're Apple, whether you're Alphabet, whether you're Meyer, whether you're Amway, whether you're Steelcase or, or Hayworth or Herman Miller, all start as small business. But no business is small to the owner. Because that man and that woman is risking his or her personal capital. They're staying up all night, many times not taking a dime out of that business to make sure that they can make payroll. So we have to reward those risk takers. We have to create an environment that is easy for them to achieve success. And we have to come alongside of our entrepreneurial um, ecosystem support partners like the SBDC, which is anchored, um, you know, one of the best in the country. I think JD said to me that it's what, top three JD, you know, in America. So congratulations on that. And that just shows, and that's a part of the ethos here in West Michigan. You know, great, I think it should be said, you don't go into business to make money. You go into business to solve a problem or to create a market. And if you do that successfully, you're going to be rewarded. And so I think it's critically important for people to understand the right mindset. And I think the work that, that uh, uh, J.D. and his team does help, helps that. Quentin, I think a lot about the fact that this is just a remarkable moment in our history. And so we need people, uh, businesses, universities, the state, to lean into this in this kind of talent production opportunity and to really have let our citizens fully participate in the economy. And um, so as I think about that, you know, I, I, I'm curious about your ideas, like how do we get more players to invest in the moment and, um, and, and really create that kind of ecosystem that can move more quickly 
um, can speak to the, um, the opportunity with a level of urgency so that we attract others uh, to participate. You know, later today, as you know, um, we're, we have one business in our community that is going to lean in and say, we've got a talent gap problem. We're going to work with the university to solve it. We're going to make an investment. But we need more of that. And I'm wondering in your palette, you know, what should we be thinking about? That's a great question. I mean, that's yeah. one of the, the questions that keeps me up at night. I mean, look, I think that we at MEDC have a role to play to be better about that connective tissue. So one of the reasons why we created that Chief Talent Solutions and Engagement Officer was as we build out the team to make sure that we are in better dialogue. It can't be accidental dialogue. You know, we happen to meet and we start chatting. It's got to be intentional. It's got to be, uh, it's gotta be uh, intentional and have the frequency. I think one of the things that I've pledged is we have to come alongside higher ed to get higher ed able to amplify its story. There's so much more that Grand Valley State University does that's beyond the graduates and undergraduates here. It's in the community. It's in, it involves K-12. It involves business. It involves you know, adult learners. But you just don't know that if you're not a part of the ethos. Um, and so we, we at MBDC have a role to play alongside others to better tell that. I mean, and you know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't give honor to the right place and, 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 and um, Randy Thalen and that team that's been a vital part and um, the Grand Rapids Changer and the Economic Club. There are a whole universe of folks who are thinking about providing that connectivity. Uh, but a lot of it is you just have to get out and meet people. You're not going, I mean, we all have grappled with, in, 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 in big and small ways, um, with what has happened with the pandemic. But we have to make time to talk to each other, to talk to people who, and this is, this to me is one of the most powerful things about a university. Getting people to listen to views that are not their own and getting them to listen, and um, you can disagree, but you can't be disagreeable. You shouldn't be disagreeable. And I push back anybody who wants to censor anything, because if there's ever a moment where we need to have creativity to solve the urgent demands of the day, whether it is the tragedy unfolding in Ukraine, there are parts of, um, that are unfolding in parts of South America and Sub-Saharan Africa and our own sort of challenges that we have, mental health and other things. We need the university, the life of the mind, whether you're in the K-12 space, two year, four year, we need people to be able to be open and receptive to new knowledge and new information. And I think that that happens and we activate that by talking more about what's going to be announced, having opportunities like this, making sure that I am better informed in real time so that a constant part of what I'm talking about is what's Grand Valley doing? I should be thinking, make sure I, make sure I talk about Grand Valley. Because a vital part of it is just, you know, sometimes if you, you know, there's a reason why your teacher used to say the same thing to you three times. It takes about three times for you to, yeah. to for me it takes about 15 times if you talk to my wife. But, but the point is that's, it's a process. We have to trust the process. We have to begin to figure out across 10 plus million Michiganders living on two peninsulas, what unites us? There'll be a lot of things we'll disagree about. But what unites us, and what unites us is that desire to problem solve. And I think higher ed is a crucial part of that. So that's, it's incumbent upon me to make sure in everything I talk about, the relevancy. Because ultimately, the number one thing every business is talking about today is talent. Mm -hmm. Talent, talent, talent. 
and higher end is a big part of that. Watch what you wish for. Now you're going to be hearing from me every other day. Quite that will be <laughs> wonderful. That will be wonderful. That's exactly what we should be doing. Be sure if you're in the audience yes. and you have questions to approach the mic so that we, we know you've got something you want to. Please? Yes. Call. It's a message. My name is Alan Piet. I'm the tech team manager for the SBDC. And I first wanted to thank you, your organization, and Fred Molnar specifically for funding us because without funding, the SBDC team wouldn't be here. But I always represent my client, and that's the early stage technology company. And there are two things that frustrates them with the MEDC and with the state right now. The state has a perception that from an investment point of view, it is risk adverse, that there is very little money. And the second thing that frustrates them, they read in the paper, there's a lot of federal money coming in. And there does not seem to be an answer as to when that money will be deployed. When I talk to my colleagues at the MEDC, it's, it's coming. When is it coming? Well, some people say it was supposed to be in April. Now it's going to be September. And from an entrepreneur that is struggling, that is trying to make a go at a business, to not be able to have its economic development agency respond, I'd rather that the agency said, we don't know, it's going to be February of 2023. So right now, you are taking at the MEDC somewhat of a criticism in the ecosystem because there's money from the feds, it's coming in Michigan, what is Michigan doing with that money? So I'd like to have your, your reaction as to how we can change that perception through communications from the MEDC into the ecosystem through the smart zones or through other methodology through the SBDC, but that we can at least say to the people, you're heard, we're doing something about it, and here's a potential strategy. No, that's a that's a house two, at least two questions, may even be a third question. <laughs> uh, they were all outstanding. I'm going to say so, keep the questions short so the answers can be long. Yeah. So, but 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 but. <laughs> yeah. No, we get that. So uh, here here's a couple of things. So um, we at MEDC don't control as much money as people think we do. Um, and the American Rescue Plan dollars are part of a broader conversation between the executive and legislative branches. And they are, are working on an agreement on a supplemental budget. Um, it could, those dollars could be a part of that. There's also uh, a fiscal 2023 budget. Those dollars could be a part of it. Those are part of conversations. That's not an excuse. That's just a reality. We, we can't allocate money we don't, we don't have and we don't control. Um, the piece about being risk averse, I do think that, um, I think that's valid. I, but let me explain, let me explain, um, and, and people don't want expl explanations, but let me try, try it out. Um, People aren't built, at least in my, my view of the world, to just say no. So you have to understand, why do people get to a place where they feel like they have to say no? Like that's their instinctual response. And then one thing that I would say is, when you're dealing with the public's dollars, it becomes very challenging for you if you don't get it right there, the public is very unforgiving about making mistakes. And so we have entrepreneurs who say, hey, if I just could get support, I get support from X, Y, and Z state, or I'm being called from X, Y, and Z state. I get that. But we have shown, and we can look through history, even when money didn't go out, just the announcement that money could go to somebody and it turned out that business didn't do well or whatever, there was a chilling effect. And we have legislators who say, look, you know, have you done your due diligence? Have you done these you know, 10, 15 different steps? And it becomes challenging to reconcile these things. 
I think that the state, let me not say the state, that's not fair. MEDC can best be last in money. I think there are a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs who think we should be first in money. And we have to fundamentally ask 10 million plus people, are you comfortable with that? Are you comfortable with MEDC being the first in? And, that, and, and, and then we will elect representatives and senators and governors or whoever who behave in that way. Right now, that's not where the consensus is of the body politic. The body politic says, okay, you have put capital in, you have shown that you've got a customer base or you've shown that you've, you've pushed this along. And if you just had this extra dollop from the state, that can take you to a new level. That's kind of where the mentality is right now. And as a consequence, we have to respond to that. Now, we do try to be as creative as possible, but no one is ever going to uh, be fully satisfied. And the absolute two last things I will say is as follows. We need to develop more risk capital on the venture side and early stage side. That is something that's been a persistent challenge in this state. But I think that's changing. I think we have to do a better job of connect, excuse me, connecting corporate venture capitalists, you know, whether it's GM Ventures or, or Spectrum Ventures or whoever it might be with startups. But I also think that we have to do, and that's why I'm so grateful that, you've, that you, we have such a talented SBC um, D network. Um, we have to get people to orient their businesses into areas in which they can realize tremendous value. And people have to be willing to be flexible about what the market is telling them too. Just because I want something doesn't mean that everybody else will want it. And so I may need to pivot my business. But sometimes it's very difficult to tell an entrepreneur if he or she has poured their heart, soul, and mind that they want to do this type of business, but maybe the market is just not there for it. So. <laughs> and, and, and to me, it's the business accelerator part so and the emerging technology. Sorry. Those online can't hear. The, the business accelerator fund and the emerging technologies fund have been very successful. Where the uh, early technology companies struggle, and I have two clients right now. One has received an attraction of $5 million, proven, uh, to move to Kentucky is in Macomb County. And to try to convince the Michigan investment community, I mean, he has a unique product, 32 patents, uh, a $12 million PO with the Department of Defense for armored plating, and nobody in Michigan seems to be responding. He wants to build a second line, and we're doing everything we can to find investment, and it's that in the early stage, we're covered. Once they are bankable, there's a lot of money through the financial system. It's that I need to scale up and I need $5 million. I need $15 million to build a big steel line. That hole is, is not being filled. And what a suggestion I'd like to make is that where you have had funding, and I understand the political logic because I'm very sensitive to, to your issues, where you funded the Delta Township uh, battery plants for General Motors, and that's the logical, absolute right place. But don't forget that you have transition plants or transition projects that have POs, and I'm very sensitive to the fact that you say the market has to be receptive, but that if there's a $12 million PO that you can maybe carve a small amount of money, and I'm talking about maybe a million to a million and a half to get these people because what the investment, the equity market is looking for is to say, show me that there's an interest in one state. And that's what in this case Kentucky did. And so I don't want that technology. I've worked 12 years with this client. I don't want him to go to Kentucky. I want his R&D center to be mm -hmm. in Michigan. 
create the higher paying jobs versus the manufacturing jobs and think about in your pool of money that attracts the big ones that can create 900 jobs, 1,000 jobs, which I understand is the politics is reality of the real world. But put a little bit of money for the system where the SBDC is creating a list and saying, these are projects that are bankable eventually, jobs are created, and they're POs. So it's not a wishful thinking. And it's that money that I'm looking for to help the client base. Thank well, you. let's talk about this offline. Yes. I appreciate yes. it. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Caitlin Hanley Semmelbauer, Director of Donor Relations. Thanks for being here. Um, really appreciated what you've said so far about amplifying our story and storytelling. That's a lot of what I do with our donor base. Um, curious to hear your thoughts on articulating the value of a liberal arts education, which is something we do extremely well here, but I don't know that we always articulate it well, and I think we could do that better for our donors, but also preparing our students to be able to talk about that as they enter the workforce. Um, you know, it's, it's much easier, I think, if you have a nursing degree or an accounting degree or a professional degree, mm -hmm going into a workforce and articulating what you've learned and what the value is, but when you have an English degree, I had a political science degree, how do you articulate that and, and make it relevant to the workforce, which I think it is. Thank no, you. No, it's a great question. Go ahead, President, please. Okay, it's just thank you, Caitlin, please. <laughs> no, I, um, I'm a public policy. Uh, I, was, I was telling uh, the President and others earlier, I had about one semester, I, I had a, a cup of coffee in engineering an engineer <laughs> and they told me take my happy behind over to the 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 um, a b part of the curriculum look i think there are three things that those I, I fundamentally believe in the value of a liberal arts education because i think that there, there are three things that i think every graduate of a liberal arts degree should really think about the ability to problem solve I do think that probably for liberal arts graduates, internships or co-curricular activities are gonna be much more important because it's that relevancy piece. So I think they, those graduates may have to work a little bit harder to sort of have that relevancy piece. Um, but I think the final point is so much of the world is about your ability to integrate knowledge that may cause you to question pre-existing knowledge, your receptivity to the new. And this is not to say anything else about any other degree, field, or, or anything. But I do think if you are a comparative literature or a history major or a French major or a Spanish major or, or anthropology major or sociolo sociology or economics or poli sci, English, whatever, you have a predisposition. That's not saying others don't. Mm -hmm. But I think you have a predisposition to be open to things that challenge. Because you went through a process in your educational experience of being challenged. And I think so much of life is about being able to deal with that which you haven't seen before. Heck, we just went through a pandemic. I don't think anybody was around, or at least around as an adult, in 1918, the last time we did this. So we needed to be able to integrate and communicate. That's the great value, theoretically, of a liberal arts education. The ability to communicate in a written form and orally. And I think graduates and, and programs have to emphasize that. Because I can tell you how many times you've been in meetings and, and you've been with colleagues and you said, if I could just extract what's in, in her brain and get it communicated, we could move this thing forward. But, you, but that inability to sort of bridge that gap, and that's the value. And I also, you know, it's not STEM, it should be STEAM. You know, and I think that you can see so much with, you know, user interface, and there's so many things in technology that require um, graduates 
um, who have the type of sensibilities that liberal arts graduates. I hope that was helpful. But I, I am, I'm obviously biased, but I think that it's making sure people understand the problem solving, the ability to communicate, and the ability to be open to new knowledge in a way um, that doesn't, you know, some people recoil. Like you give them some new information, they're like, I don't want to know that. <laughs> well, that's not, that's not really even human, right? That's not how you solve problems. That's not how you move forward. You've got to be open to being challenged, but yet not feel unmoored just because something that you thought was right was proven wrong. That's learning. That's the, that's the, that's the whole enterprise yeah, of what we, what we do here, or what you do here. Yeah, I really like the way you asked the question, Caitlin, because it's not just about preparation, it's about translation and how we really get people to feel comfortable. The, I, I love the, the, I can't remember where I was reading it, but they, the phraseology of enduring skills because it's what people are asking for and asked for over time. And I think how we translate the enduring skills, how we practice them, how we see them in context of work, not just life. You know, that's, that's an area where we can set ourselves apart. Um, and I love Quentin's continued call for an and rather than an or. Um, and there's no reason to not adopt into that journey professional skills that help us to, um, to create a clear, um, deeper relevance uh, to the, the workforce today. Enduring skills, timely skills, relevant skills, um, translated. Do we have others from the audience? Paul. Hey, Paul. Hi there. Good morning. Paul Stansby. I wear a couple of hats here at the institution. One of them is a professor of hospitality and tourism management. Um, you mentioned a number of industries that have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Few probably hit much harder than the tourism industry. Um, we realize that work has been done to resecure funding for the Pure Michigan campaign. Thank you for that. What is being done twofold, really, in terms of securing longer-term funding for that so it's a sustainable sort of marketing initiative that will continue to bring visitors to our state? And secondly, what can be done to help with talent pipeline? You mentioned that before, and how we can drive more people to an industry that is desperate need uh, right now as we start to rebuild the economy? Yeah, great questions. You know, I am, um, prior to coming to Michigan, I w lived in New Orleans and led economic development in New Orleans, and you talk about a city that was devastated because it's the tourism and hospitality is the number one industry. And, you know, the tragedy of the pandemic is it attacked socialization. Um, and, um, Few places are more tactile in their socialization than New Orleans. I mean, you can come to Michigan and you can you can water ski on Lake Michigan, or you can snowboard, or you can snowmobile, or you can snowshoe. But in New Orleans, I mean, people hugging and kissing and sharing drinks and oysters and whatever. <laughs> I mean, so it really was a challenge. Um, so uh, on the Pure Michigan question. It is one of those things that's very difficult. In times of budget shortage, people perceive that that's the time to cut marketing dollars. I would argue that's the time to double down. Because at some point, people are gonna have money again and you wanna make sure that your message endured through that. I also think that we have to do, and this is an opportunity for higher, we have to be much more sophisticated about segmenting tourism hospitality. We could be in Michigan health and wellness tourism, intellectual tourism. We've got all these great universities. Why? You know, we should have a festival of, of books or something anchored here at, 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 at Grand Valley State that's a globally recognized sort of, uh, of, of, of celebration of the life and the mind that brings people on. We should be doing you know, wine tours, and we have the second most diversified agricultural economy behind California and the U.S. And so we have to be much more thoughtful about segmenting 
our tourism and hospitality. On the talent pipeline, we have to be better about helping people understand not only the direct skills that you could have going through tourism and hospitality, but also the correlative skills. You learn how to be a human being if you've ever waited tables or busted tables. You learn how to deal with, you learn how and understand the adage that you know, the client is, or customer is always right until you get a better customer. <laughs> you know, that, those things will carry you whether you're going to become a chemical engineer, a plasma physicist, or whatever. That ability to be human, to be empathetic, those are those correlative skills. And we also have to show, you know, it's not just, oh, the only thing I can do if I do tourism hospitality is work in a restaurant or work in a hotel. There's nothing wrong with those things. But sometimes people want to see other things. Well, sports marketing event marketing, political marketing in many respects. I mean, get out to vote is almost like um, doing hospitality. I mean, that correlative ability, but that comes if we are in conversation with higher ed and understanding the literature, the, 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 the research, where, where is it going? And so um, I, I worked, my first real job was working in Spencer's Gifts. Anybody ever remember Spencer's yeah. Gifts? It was that odd <laughs> store in the mall. Usually it was like in the dark corner of the mall, <laughs> right? It had all this kind of odd stuff. Well, that was my first job, right? And some odd people would roll through Spencer's Gifts. <laughs> let me tell you, back in 19, summer of 1985 in Jacksonville, Florida, but I learned that you can't complain if people just mess up the display after you just straighten it up. You have to understand that people are impatient. Most people are not going to go back and put back, they don't want the item, they did discard it, they're gonna just put it somewhere. Don't be upset with them, you, you act the same way. I act the same way. I mean, we're impatient. So you, I learned at you know, 16 going on 17, things that now, at almost 54, that I think about when I talk to the governor or talk to the Speaker of the House or talk to the Senate uh, Majority Leader, Senate Minority Leader. Pause, be patient, be empathetic. Understand that they're your customer. Until you find a better customer, they're right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, until you know, you obviously try to affect the the purchase decision or, or whatever decision. But those are the things that we can do. But look, um, our labor, the broader issue, the underlying issue in your question, professor, is the labor force participation rate is not where it should be here in Michigan or nationally. It's a it's a national problem. What we realized with the pandemic, it disproportionately affected women. We saw that we do not have, I think, a, a workforce system that is so fully supportive of over half the population. We asked them to make too many sacrifices. But I always say the other thing that, that I think that this um, tragic pandemic has exposed is that the fundamental thing, I think the number one existential threat facing the US is mental health. There are a lot of people who are not participating, people who could have had those introductory jobs in, in restaurants, in hotels and hospitalities, are dealing with things that don't allow them to present their full selves to themselves or even to the marketplace. And I think we as a, we as a collective have to come together and think about how we're going to solve that. So, so as we look at this and we look at trying to draw people back in, one of the things that we know as we come out of the, uh, out of the pandemic that uh, there's going to be a lot of new business creation happening. And, and so I sort of have two pieces to that. One is 
is how do we help students move in that direction? And the second piece that I have is here in, here in West Michigan, uh, we haven't seen this business creation, particularly among uh, some of the minority groups here, or disadvantaged groups here in, in West Michigan. We see the, the, the creation increasing, uh, but it's not happening in those communities. How do we reach those communities to help them and lift them up to create new businesses? Yeah, those are, those are really, man, you know, ask really smart people ask tough questions. So, <laughs> um, on the overall student entrepreneurship, I, I think there are really probably three things that can happen. One, we have to figure out how to grade young people who decide as part of their, their journey through college, they're gonna um, try to start a business. How is there a way to sort of grade that or use that for academic credit? Because, you know, it, it's, it's, you can't, I mean, your, your, your studies could suffer while you're trying to build the, the, the next best mousetrap. How do you sort of bridge that? That's one. Two, culturally, and I think this is certainly the case in West Michigan, um, we have to be willing, you know, sometimes when things don't work, or, 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 or things are not as successful as you hope, we brand people. They fail, or that fail. You know what failed is whoever didn't try. That person's a success. They went for it. They tried to make a play. So the same way that we value people trying to make effort in athletics, we need to have that same, adopt that same mentality in business, and so we have to uh, allow for young people who maybe didn't go through um, and go through those corporate internships but tried to work on a business while they were here but, but, but you know they get burned out or they lose or, or whatever they say hey you know I, I need some security we need to find a way to sort of uh, validate those experiences because right now they're not validated and I think that speaks to you know, there is rich entrepreneurship in um, BIPOC communities. I, I, I just read John McWhorter, the, the linguist, was saying that nobody says BIPOC. So, you know, but people of color, right? right. You know, black, brown, um, tribal communities, you know, whatnot, um, Asian communities. There is a rich vein of entrepreneurship. But because so many people, particularly first-gen people of color, tend to go to college with debt, you know, parents are like, look, we sacrificed. We took out some loans. You took out some loans. You need to go roll up and get a job at, you know, Meyer or Steelcase because now once you pay off the debt or whatever, then you can go, so we have to figure out ways to de-risk the entrepreneurial journey. And we don't always have ways, because black and brown folks typically don't have the social network, so you spend your 20s trying to start a business or trying to be an entrepreneur. And maybe it, and it, doesn't, maybe it doesn't work the way that you hope. You wake up 30 and you show your resume and there are companies that no one's ever heard of, then you then have to, then your experience is invalidated sometimes and you now have to compete with a recent college graduate and you're now 30. What is the signal that that's saying to others in that community? Right. And so people are remarkably rational. People are like, look, I saw so and so, and I saw what he went through or what she went through. Oh, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> so I'm, you know. And as I tell people, if you're gonna jump out there when you know it's a sure thing, the window is gonna be closed. And you know, we have, we don't, we don't have soft landings necessarily equally for everybody. And I think that leads to why 
there's some of the reputation. But there are things changing. Um, shout out to Burgett Close, and there's a group that's, that has funded a um, fund here in West Michigan mm -hmm. for entrepreneurship of color, and they got a talented uh, young brother who I think went to Harvard. Yeah. Um, man, I mean, that type of thing, that, that, that could potentially change it. Yeah, and I think universities can be such an important part of that, Clinton, mm -hmm. with both encouraging that sort of risk while as a part of the educational journey, supporting it. We have centers for entrepreneurship. We have ways that people can get coached and counseled very early on, and even angel funding um, we're at de-risk. So, you know, I think there's more institutions can do at the intersection of um, new ventures, uh, entrepreneurship, and, and learning where we make it a part of a learning journey rather than, uh, you know, a high-risk venture at the end of it. No, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Is there ways we can use some of the communication that you've talked about uh, to, to get people outside of Michigan to view venture capital beyond Ann Arbor? I mean, right now, 90, 95% of venture capital lands in Michigan, lands within 20 miles of Ann Arbor. Um, how do we get them to view the west side? That's a, that's a great question. So, um, we at MEDC have to be a, a, we have to be a better megaphone, in part. Um, I think also uh, there's an opportunity for our business community. You know, I think, um, in biz does a tremendous job of, of talk, telling the story, um, messaging what's happening. So I think we need to continue to support them and nurture them and, and communicate about um, what's coming out of the university, things of nature coming out of SB, um, uh, small business development centers and, and their, their, their the companies they're consulting, with whom they're consulting. But really, you know, you begin to get buzz as an entrepreneurial ecosystem when you have strategic access. I mean, you know, we were, you know, I was in New Orleans for, you know, six years, um, Louisiana for a total of nine. And man, they, New Orleans can brand stuff. I mean, you know, a city that care for God, which is not very helpful for business, but it was what it was. <laughs> um, you know, the Big Easy and the blah, 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 you know, the Crescent City. But it, like everybody, wanted to be Silicon Valley or Silicon Valley or Alley or whatever. But I think New Orleans now has credibility because they had two firms. One had a billion dollar exit and one had a half billion dollar exit. So exits beget credibility. That, 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 that companies can grow successfully in place in Grand Rapids. I think the challenge is it's clear companies can grow. There are so many wonderful family owned businesses, but they have no desire to go public. So you don't really know their valuations. And so it's, you know they're doing good because you're like, look, you know Grand Rapids is doing well when you look at some of the amenities mm -hmm. in Grand Rapids for a city this size, mm -hmm. you kidding me? <laughs> you got a JW Marriott that's top shit. Really? <laughs> you looking at some of the some of the concerts that fall through here? There's some money falling through here. But there's a perception that it is a different type of money. So I think that one of the things we need to do is figure out. Is there ways that we can connect with, for example, you know, we need to find out where Steel Case, Hayworth, and Herman Mill and Noel, where they're investing. In. Do they have a corporate venture on? That's what we need to be trying. Because I would think companies here that's invested in that sector should that's do well because you got three of the top in that whole sector right here. We need to be talking to, to Spectrum. You know, we need to be talking to Meyer, you know, what, what are you doing in vertical farming? What are you doing mm -hmm. in food traceability? And, and begin to try to stir, because it's an ecosystem. And so you gotta 
you got to go where you get the love, but you have to go where you also where you also have cultivated a space. I think the other thing that some of the the big companies are talking about in the venture space is setting up so that they can get the learning out of the venturing. Because sometimes it's like venturing's over here and it's happening and maybe you'll hit mm -hmm. a unicorn, but but the real asset of venturing is all that energy, creativity, learning. And so I think, you know, this kind of like, how do we create these ecosystems with education, our big corps, our small corps, all around creativity and things will begin to move. I know we're at our time um, and I just uh, would love for you to, thank you Paul very much for, for leading the conversation. Thank you Quentin for being here. I will make a commitment to bring Michigan out wherever I go in terms of the excitement here in our economy. I know you'll bring Grand Valley out wherever you go. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, uh, and we'll just keep the energy going. So thank you for being with us. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.